Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming to the uh, post-flight press conference for Flight 61A in Space Lab D1. Uh, to tell us about the uh, flight and the gathering of scientific data during uh, that entire period is uh, the uh, flight crew headed up by Hank Hartsfield. Uh, Hank, uh, why don't you proceed with your uh, uh, video and your slides? Okay. Uh, first, let me say that uh, I'm very pleased you came out to listen to us. I think uh, we've got a story to tell you. Well, before we get into the film, I'd like to introduce to you to the the uh, the best space lab crew that's ever flown. I'm really proud of it. <laughs> it's my pilot Steve Nagel, who headed up the orbiter side of the operations from the blue team, and Jim Buckley, mission specialist, who headed up the red team for the orbiter. Bonnie Dunbar, mission specialist, one of the payload crew with the blue team, and Guy Bluford uh, with the red team. And then Ernst Messerschmitt from Germany on the red team, Reinhard Futter from Germany on the blue team, and Vubo Ockels from the Netherlands, who uh, sort of floated between the two teams. Uh, we kind of called him purple, but I... <laughs> But they were an exceptional crew. I've never seen five people work in the space lab as hard as they did. We planned 12-hour days in the lab. I think in actuality they came closer to being 15-hour days, but the results speak for themselves. So without further ado, I think what we'd like to do now is show you a little film that we rushed together to give you the highlights of the flight, show you a few slides, and then we'd entertain any questions you may have. Okay, I'll pick it up uh, at this point. Uh, there was no doubt at the time uh, of launch we were ready to fly. However, there was one question in our minds the last few days before the launch, and that was the weather, because Hurricane Juan was turning around in the Gulf uh, going one way and then another, and uh, never actually threatened the launch. However, we were under the influence of that hurricane, and uh, some spiral bands of weather had passed by the Cape. I guess the night before launch, uh, we had some thunderstorms around Florida, which is usually a good omen for good weather the next day. And sure enough, the next day when we got out there, uh, it was perfectly clear when we climbed in the vehicle. And I think there were just a few scattered clouds uh, inland little ways by the time we launched. Uh, we launched right on time, 12 o'clock, straight up. And as uh, shuttle launches go, it was, uh, I guess, kind of a ho-hum launch. Everything was nominal and worked just as it should. for. Anybody who rides through it, I don't think it's very ho-hum. Uh, even a nominal launch is pretty exciting. But uh, the important thing is that everything worked quite well. Uh, all the systems worked very well and put us into the orbit that we desired to go into. The, the roll maneuver off the launch pads uh, considerably larger on one of these missions because instead of flying due east from the Cape, we had northeast up the coast. So it was a, uh, probably to a spectator on the ground, it, it looked impressive. Uh, it was a 135 degree roll. Uh, first stage was uh, was a normal first stage, duration of which was two minutes until the solid rockets burned out, uh, at which time that they were kicked off. There's a good scene of uh, solid rocket booster separation. And for the uh, next six and a half minutes, uh, we monitored systems and everything, as I said before, worked fine. Uh, I'm not sure what it looks like out the window. I took a couple of peeks, but all the rest of the time, uh, my eyes were on the gauges all the way through ascent and uh, never saw anything anomalous at all. The post-insertion timeline uh, went very well, got the payload bay doors open, and we were uh, on or ahead of the timeline. And then two hours into the mission, we were into space lab activation, which Bonnie will talk about. Uh, we started right on time with activation. Uh, Steve and I got the lab powered up. We got down to the door, uh, the hatch, about uh, 3.15, 3.30. Once I got into the tunnel, it was uh, just like training. Uh, very familiar. The inner hatch, tunnel hatch, opened very easily, buckled down. Uh, getting into the lab was just like going into the trainer. In fact, I, I was amazed at how familiar everything seemed. And we started right down the timeline. Also, uh, being a little bit of an ambitious flight, uh, not only did we start act the rest of the activation there, which we had another hour to do, but also started right into experiments. Uh, uh, Bubo, Reinhardt, uh, Ernst, and Guy all came in and started setting up. Uh, towards the end of activation, then uh, Ernst and Guy went to bed. The red ship started sleeping fairly early. I uh, started with a comm and then worked the uh, way around uh, for the avionics air loops and the rest of the subsystems. Uh, Reinhardt uh, helped start setting up some of the sled and, and the central venous pressure, which he'll talk about later. 
and Bobo started setting up the flight data file. I was particularly impressed with the tunnel, and you'll get to see a few more views about this, but very easy to translate down. Uh, it was an interesting uh, area to experiment with in terms of the vestibular system, and uh, very much like a silo. Uh, we had a little bit of fun in there. I'm going to take you down the tunnel right now. It's uh, a little bit dark. We have a couple lights off. Uh, this goes down, it's translating down the uh, long portion of the tunnel towards the mid deck. Uh, we hit the uh, tunnel adapter rotating here. You can see uh, some of our garbage that uh, we stowed here. It was a cool area. We found a good place to stow it, and it was out of the way. Coming through the uh, tunnel hatch into the tunnel adapter and into the airlock, which was not only the area where we stowed our uh, clothing from launch and landing, but where Vubo slept most of the time. Nice dark area. And we come into a, a lightly or a, a darkly lit uh, mid-deck area. You can see the teleprinter light up there and around the stairs. I'm going to come up and say a few words to the flight deck crew who have been busy taking many Earth Ops photos. You get a chance to look at those a little later. Usually had this view as I came up. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise, I'm here. <laughs> And uh, can I visit and take a few moments to look out the window, which the flight deck readily agreed to, and see Steve in the background there. Lots of cameras around. Uh, I think we're all very pleased with the support we got in the Earth Observations area, and the flight deck crew would talk about that again. One of the things we did uh, early on was deploy a small satellite called GLOMAR, and you see the, the lid opening up here. Uh, we opened the lid up shortly before sunset and that worked just fine. Then at sunset we maneuvered uh, to our deployment attitude. Uh, we did that in darkness uh, so that we didn't get sun into the bay which was a constraint on Navex and on the lab. Shortly after we got into the, uh, into the proper attitude uh, we did our little deployment which will work just fine. Uh, one thing that was really beautiful was to watch those sunsets every, uh, every 90 minutes. And here you see the little Glomar satellite going up. Kind of cute. <laughs> but we, uh, we uh, deployed that uh, retrograde, so eventually it wound up in a little bit lower orbit than, than what we were in. <laughs> uh, our prime objective on orbit, obviously, was to support the, the space lab. Uh, one of our secondary goals was to take uh, what we hope to be very good Earth observation pictures. This gave you a, a good idea of what the view was from the cockpit. Uh, here we saw the Atlas Mountains in Africa and Morocco. Looking down, we're looking right onto the continent of Africa. So you can see that we had more than just uh, one window to look out. This particular attitude was a Tedris pointing attitude, which gave us a nice uh, view forward. It also gave us a very nice view down into the bay using the aft windows. Uh, the layout of the cockpit was pretty much the same throughout the mission for us. Uh, we deployed our cameras strategically throughout uh, the deck, very close to the windows. Uh, normally, there would be one person uh, monitoring systems, another person uh, uh, looking on our Spock, which gave us our position over the Earth, and then one taking pictures, or the one that uh, was using Spock would also be taking pictures. We use a 16 millimeter to take these shots of uh, Western United States. This gives a nice view of uh, essentially what we saw the curvature of the Earth, uh, about the same movement uh, that you saw on that, on that photo. Uh, when we were in a gravity gradient mode, we used the overhead windows primarily. Uh, when we were in a uh, ZLV attitude, we used the forward windows uh, to get a panoramic view and then used the overhead windows, which were looking straight down, to take some very detailed Earth shots. This is another view of the western uh, United States. Here you see uh, Salt Lake. To the south of it is Lake Provo, and you're just starting to see the western part of the uh, uh, of the mountains in uh, in uh, central uh, west central United States. <clears throat> Again, you can see that we're moving at about four miles a minute, so we really cover an awful lot of terrain in a very short period of time. Okay, this is uh, unfortunately. Uh, uh, for the payload specialists, as well as the mission specialists, we have to do our work in, uh, in the uh, space lab, which means that we have to head back down the tunnel, and this is our trip back down the tunnel, going back into uh, space lab. 
Uh, one of the uh, primary experiments that we did uh, during our mission is to work the sled. And you can see in this shot, uh, Reinhardt sitting on the vestibular sled. We had uh, two teams that were working on the sled. Uh, Ernst and myself uh, on the red team uh, uh, did uh, vestibular science work uh, for the MIT people. And Reinhardt and Wubo did uh, riding on the sled for uh, the German people. And in this scene, you can see one of us, I'm not too sure who that is, uh, riding the sled in the y-axis. Surprisingly enough, I thought the ride on the sled in space was a lot easier than the ride on the sled on the ground. That looks rather provocative from the uh, spectator's point of view, but it uh, proved to be very benign from the, uh, the rider's point of view. Yeah, uh, um, we, this, everybody thought this was the largest crew ever flown, but all the three, at least, of us were hiding or disappeared in the lab. And we actually uh, started our experiments right in the mid during the launch. Between OMS 1 and 2, we measured central venous pressure. Um, due to the fluid shift phenomena, the pressure, the venous pressure should be changed. And we tried to figure this out during the whole mission. We continuously measured this. Here in this um, picture, you see that the inner eye pressure has been measured on urns by Guy. This is a a handheld tonometer where you um, expose or put some pressure on the eyeball and you measure optically what this, uh, this pressure reading is. Um, at the moment you see an experiment called hop and drop where the reflex, the spinal reflex is being measured when, when a human is released here from, from a handle and pulled down by bungees or on earth being pulled down by gravity. The landing is prepared milliseconds, 50, 60 milliseconds before touchdown and the muscles are activated and this activation is triggered by the vestibular system and this can be uh, checked out here. You see Ernst hopping being pulled down by bunches which uh, more or less replace the Earth's gravity to some extent even if the acceleration profile is different. Um, Ernst is here standing in front of the rotating dome that is a, with uh, colored dot marked uh, um, uh, dome and the illusion he gets by looking into it is uh, being floating around around the axis and you see what uh, his uh, sensations are by just looking in the eye and seeing a, a, um, a rotatory nystagmus emotion of sin. Here is a simple nice experiment free floating wobble uh, ask me where up and where down is and I try to to, to point where up is and he stops me someplace and then he asks me where is you up and you see in this moment I just say I cannot tell anymore because we prove with this experiment that there is no mechanism, no integrating mechanisms that can tell you as a subject what happened to you um, motion wise. One third of the mission was uh, devoted to life science uh, and one third approximately we devoted for material science. We had uh, five furnaces, we, have, we had process chambers, and uh, whenever you deal with the materials in space, in the microgravity environment, uh, you talk primarily about the liquid state of material. That's why basically we did the, some kind of um, basic science with the so-called fluid physics module, which was part of the uh, material science double rack, and here you see the filling of a chamber that uh, had some kind of concentration of, uh, of a given liquid and due to a concentration <coughs> difference you see some kind of, of motion of uh, convection going on. This is the so-called Marangoni convection driven by uh, concentration differences. Uh, by some other experiments uh, we proved that um, uh, for example here in a, uh, also in a free column we proved that um, there are immiscible liquids and they behave in, a, in some way as described by theory and that uh, very much depends on the temperature. That's why we always uh, changed in this device the temperature difference and looked at these phenomena and took scene pictures as well as uh, live TV. Like here, for example, a free column of uh, silicon oil to see the motions inside. Uh, we put a uh, tracer in and uh, by looking at the tracers, you see the motion and uh, this again is uh, Marangoni convection which was one of the major themes of our flight. More than uh, 30 experiments in uh, 
not only in fluid physics, but also in, in the furnaces and growing crystals, uh, were devoted to Marangoni convection, to this kind of phenomenon. Here, um, some other typical activity everybody of, of us had to do uh, quite often during the flight, that was uh, taking out the, um, the used samples uh, and uh, putting in new samples for our furnaces. As I said, we had all kinds of uh, different, different devices. Some of them had uh, constant temperature everywhere. We also had gradient heating devices. Sometimes the samples were heated uh, with mirrors, uh, for example, gold uh, surface uh, plated uh, mirror. Here you see one of the samples, a silicon crystal in the middle of the shiny part. That is the liquid zone. And by moving the furnace, we move also the uh, liquid zone through the crystal, hoping that we, uh, after the end of the process, get a very uh, clean, very homogeneous crystal uh, back to Earth. <coughs> uh, this is uh, one of the other facilities uh, that uh, caused a little bit of troubles at the beginning of the mission, but uh, we did some kind of IFM that worked out successfully. OK, we're back here to biology, <coughs> about the other third. And uh, this was the first flight which showed such a systematic large biology research. Here, uh, uh, we feed the flies, uh, which uh, got a new tray of uh, nutrition each day. And already there, we found an absolutely new phenomenon that is that uh, flies in space do not know where to put their eggs. Uh, they don't put their eggs on the, on the uh, feeding tray all the time. And actually, the eggs which are not put there uh, have already shown to be abnormal and relatively different from the ground. Uh, many results, uh, very previous results we have from this uh, research we did <coughs> on different cells and bacteria, and, and uh, it's extremely interesting to see what, uh, what will come out there. Uh, at the mid-DAC, we also used some of our liquids, in this case orange juice, to uh, show some other uh, effects on uh, what the zero gravity can do to us. Um, as a nuclear physicist, I'm uh, always interested in seeing uh, liquid drops being excited with different modes of vibrations. And uh, Reinhardt had a uh, little tool here to do that, uh, like uh, uh, with some air which would uh, puff out these little openings on the sides, puff out with different frequencies, and you sometimes see that the droplet really moves and sometimes gets even to into a square shape. Nice. If you just uh, watch carefully, Here, now, now you see it. Um, it's really impressive, zero gravity. Floating is uh, something which you fall in love with uh, very quickly. Actually, it gets very difficult if you come back to, uh, to uh, get used to this sticky earth, which pulls you down all the time. Here, um, here you see what you can do. You can very gently try to move a big blob of, uh, of liquid around and try to get it in different modes of oscillation. The only thing you have to make sure is that it's not that big, that eventually, if you need to do it, you can still swallow it. <laughs> here was our uh, master who teached us how to do it, because he, was, he flew before. <laughs> One other aspect of gravity, I wanted, or, or zero gravity, I wanted to show is uh, 500 years ago, we were all challenged by Columbus to put an egg uh, on its tip without letting it falling over. And uh, here is the boiled egg, and here I show how you can do that. Um, also, it reminded uh, a little bit to the fact that uh, Europe uh, has uh, called its participation program in the uh, space station uh, by the name of Columbus, so it was uh, appropriate to show that egg. Uh, little uh, roots of, uh, of garden grass you see here. and. Uh, one of the funny things where we were all were very concerned whether these uh, seeds will really grow and the roots will really grow the way uh, they do on Earth. And one thing you see is that seeds did come out, or the, the roots did come out, but they all came out in different directions, uh, also because they did not sense gravity. And uh, this experiment was uh, one of those very successful ones. <laughs> Here we see uh, corn seeds having grown, and this was a uh, experiment where we wanted to investigate the hormone transportation in the roots, which basically would give the information of where down is. And uh, we have uh, shown, uh, the pre preliminary result shows that the uh, plants did behave exactly the same way in space as on the ground. Here we have a, still a general view of the laboratory, which after a few days starts to look like a real Earth laboratory, that is to say, uh, procedures and papers and things hang over, all over, uh, which uh, was very nice uh, during the working period, but um, for some of us, uh, actually the red crew had to clean up later on. It probably was pretty much a, uh, a lot of work to get everything squared away. 
This is a shot of uh, Bonnie coming back from uh, from the lab to the mid deck. Uh, even though we spent 12 hours or 15 hours in space lab, we had to come back and uh, partake, so to speak, of uh, of the food in the mid deck. And so this is a shot of the uh, blue team getting ready to fix a meal. You can see uh, Hank is taking uh, some of the uh, food containers out of the pantry or out of the uh, galley, which worked extremely well throughout the whole mission. And uh, the team is putting the food on the food tray. And in this scene, you can see the uh, three of the crew members are, uh, have lodged themselves down in various positions in the mid-deck with their individual food trays. Uh, eating the meals. And you'll find that eating in space is very similar to eating on Earth. Uh, you use a knife, fork, and spoon, and uh, we ate out of refrigerator kind of dishes, as shown in that last scene. We ran a few experiments of our own on the mid-deck. Uh, one of the pairs of binoculars we carried are uh, very high-powered gyro-stabilized, and with the gyro cage to put the motor turning, you can see some effects of gyroscopic precession. Also on the mid deck to the right of the, or left of that scene rather, you'll see the treadmill, which we did use uh, for cardiovascular conditioning. Uh, I've always had a thing about <coughs> Jim having bigger arms than I have, and I thought I'd set out to correct that on this mission, but it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the mid deck is our, our living area, uh, sleeping area, the, the whole nine yards, and uh, uh, it would get pretty congested at hand over times, so although at other times uh, like this, uh, there's a fair amount of room down there when people were back working in the lab. Uh, when, you, when you operate on Earth, a normal spring, then the spring force has to be at least that great, that large, that it can carry its own weight. If you go in zero G, then you can adjust both quanti uh, quantity, uh, qualities in a, in, a, in a way that the motion, the propagation of waves a longer spring happens very, very slowly. So we carried a few springs with us and did some experiments. Uh, it looks as if we would have had a lot of time, but I have to tell you that most of these demonstration experiments have been done the last night where we rushed through and sure, we took a few pictures, but you see, I managed finally to, to get some of these fundamental oscillation in springs and this is something when you really study them, gives you a nice insight because you don't, you cannot do this on Earth. Well, we didn't have that much uh, laser time. Uh, only a few uh, times, uh, spots in time where I really operated the ham radio. That was a good way to find out where you are. You always could uh, uh, listen to strange voices from all over the world. <laughs> and uh, but we had an automatic device that also recorded all these um, these voices and calls. Sometimes I got the impression that they were heating up the shuttle, so many uh, airwaves uh, or uh, <laughs> radio waves came up to the shuttle. These shots are the uh, shots taken on the last day of the mission, and you can see the, uh, the blue team is up trying to get the uh, ship ready, and the red team, Ernst and myself, are ba back in the lab closing it out for the last time. We ended up shutting down all the experiments and putting stuff away, and uh, the last day was really quite a busy day trying to uh, get the lab in order before shutting it down and uh, proceeding home. And uh, in these scenes here, you can see both Ernst and myself short of doing the last little item, shutting down the space lab. Well, the closeout went remarkably fast and remarkably well. I, I was really pleased with it. We had an uneventful entry. Here we see the tracking cameras at Edwards picking us up uh, in the turn around the head and alignment circle of somewhere around 40,000 feet. Uh, I took manual control of the spacecraft at just under Mach 0.9 after the Mach buffet. Uh, the bird handles real well. It uh, flies just as nicely as uh, Discovery and Columbia did. I was well pleased with the handling qualities. Uh, here I'm about to roll out on final. We're up. Uh, I guess about 10,000 feet at this point. Uh, got right on the desired glide slope and brought it in towards the landing. Uh, Steve did his job for us and, and got the wheels down. Uh, that's always a very important part of the mission. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the weather was just as forecast. It was a beautiful day. It was calm.